Um, the time is 21 minutes to 10 o'clock and uh, we have a very interesting guest on the line. I would have loved her to have come into the studio, but it's winter and it's cold and uh, we want Emma to stay lovely and warm and look after herself. So good morning, Emma. Emma Mashinini, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good morning, Maggie. Well, Emma, I have been raving about you the whole morning because after, well, throughout um, reading your book, I was touched so deeply by your story. And I just thought I I was looking so forward to actually speaking to you and and hearing the stories come from your mouth. But what struck me was that this book was written originally in 1989. And that's a long time ago, Emma, and it was first published in England. But it's only just come to South Africa. Mm-hmm. Why is that? Well, because of our laws in the country at that time, the book could not be uh, published here in mm-hmm. South Africa. Mm-hmm. It was first published in England, and then it was published in America. Mm-hmm. And then only now are we publishing it in South Africa. Why did you wait so long, let's say from 1994, to have it published here? It's such an important story, Emma. Um, You know, at times it's so good when you have children who question you, like you are questioning me now. Well, I thought I told my story, and that's it. Mm. I didn't know that the story will still be valuable and uh, are the young ones interested in the story? And thanks to Jay Naidu, who is the one who pursued to say that, Ma Emma, I want this story to be told. Mm. So if it wasn't for him, it didn't just come from me. Mm-hmm. I told my story at the beginning. So now it's good if people appreciated it or thought they can learn something from it and make sure that you talk to us like I'm talking to you now. Mm-hmm. Well, Emma, I'm delighted that uh, Jay Naidu persevered. He wrote a wonderful foreword in the book um, because, as I said to you, it's such an important story to be told and that it will always be relevant. A story like this is always relevant, a story of a woman, of, of a wife, of a mother, of uh, a shop steward, of a a, a torture victim, uh, a person who has overcome all of these things. Um, And you have just an amazing uh, legacy, Emma. I'd like to go back um, to your youth. I'd like to go back to um, the description uh, when you were younger and you spoke about this home of yours, that it was just a one-bedroom home, but that your mother took such incredible pride and, um, you know, the way you describe the policy floors and that the home was always filled with people who would come past and at the entrance you would have you describe these wonderful flowers these hydrangeas these Christmas flowers and, and you had the this canary bird yeah, and the can exactly the canary bird so colorful mm-hmm. um, Emma such a wonderful vivid description uh, when you when you think back on the time is is that how you you see it and I'm talking about before your parents separated yes. was it just filled with color and warmth it was I mean it took me back last week when the ANC had the touch of light taken to Dr. Kuma's home Mm -hmm. because my home was very close to Kuma's home. Yes. So it took me back to my home. That's the kind of home I had. It was a very, very beautiful home. Very well kept home. It was a one bedroom home with a little kitchenette. But my mother was so petite so, so uh, uh, you know, very arranged about what she wanted in her home. Yes. And it was always very neat. And I boast about we never ate from, you know, sitting on the floor on one plate or whatever. It, it may have just been basins meant for dessert. But everyone ate from that little dish, you know, and so forth. It was... 
a very care. Mm. Mm-hmm. It sounded it, I must say. That that's, mm. that was the impression I got. Mm. But then, of course, everything changed. I mean, when you were 14, your parents separated, and that had a huge impact on your life. Yes, yes, it did. And uh, as I state in the book that my mother then went to Cape Town because my elder sister had gone to Cape Town. But I decided that I want to to find my dad because my father, who I have always been very proud of, was never at home, but he catered for his home. The very fact that my mother was never a worker, never gone out to work, mm. and the type of home I say we come from, and seeing us going to school, how we were always, you know, tidy and everything. Mm. It just shows that I came from a very wonderful home. Mm. Yeah. And Emma, you, you describe in the book that your father did disappear, as you say, and you decided to stay in Joburg because you wanted to look for him. And then you would find him, and then he would disappear for a while. He would promise to meet you somewhere, and he mm-hmm. would disappoint you. Mm-hmm. And yet, what I, I while I was reading it, there was no anger. There was no resentment. You were able to you know, process whatever reason why your father did that, you processed it. Because in fact, you had a wonderful relationship with your father. He was so present from after that period of when he kept disappearing, he was always in your life. Was there a time when you when you felt you couldn't forgive him? Or did you just understand why that was happening? I, I, I don't know if I want to say I understood but I never was angry with him. Mm. And at the end, he was the father who catered again for all of us. Mm -hmm. Because when my sisters and brother came back from my grandmother's place, when I collected them, we all ended up in a home with my dad. Mm. And he has always had this warm home until when he passed on in his 80s. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that again, that was for me was so strong because it was just such a, a, a sense of redemption and forgiveness. And that mm-hmm. in life, if we do forgive people, do. the people that we love and we allow them mm-hmm. to redeem themselves, just how wonderful that can be. And, and, and that's what happened. He was a living example of that in your life. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. And again, I am very proud about that because it means that we were all together for yeah. my father's send off. Mm. And that goes for my mother's send-off in Cape Town, you know. Mm. We, we we became one family again. <laughs> we were all together. Yeah. Mm. Unfortunately, Emma, you couldn't continue with your studies and you got married very young. How did that impact on your life? Well, it did. I do regret that, but I think a lot has come out of it. You know, during that time, I think being in Joburg or wherever we were or my parents were, we started schooling quite early because at age six, we were already in school in City Deep at the Methodist School. Mm -hmm. And after the first removal, we were then moved to like Sophia Town when we didn't go to Orlando. And I attended school at Salvation Army, passed my standard six very well, and went to uh, the secondary school, Madibani. Well, it was my JC when I left. So I did not go beyond my JC. Mm -hmm. But um, I would say it's a pity, but not many regrets, because uh, maybe God provided that I do other things. Hmm. Yep. So you you got married very young, and within a short space of time, you had you ha- you gave birth to six children, Emma, but unfortunately, you lost three. Yes. 
um, which 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 must have been absolutely horrific for for such a young woman. Mm. And especially under the circumstances, because you talk about these um, young, beautiful yellow babies, and and you only realised afterwards that in fact they had yellow died from jaundice. Mm. At the time, we is the time when we were thinking that the lighter you are in complexion, um, the better the life is for you, mm. and. The yellow they are, I always thought the father had a very fair complex. Maybe they've taken after the father or whatever. But no one said to me, it's jaundice, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's how I lost the baby quite early. And the last one child was in 1956. I always say, I'm sure this. it was in September. This is why I could not have gone to the woman's march. Hmm. Yep. And uh, uh, Emma, you you know, obviously you you took a, a strong stance. I mean, you believe that a lot of these hospitals, um, the doctors are there, and they just simply don't explain it. And they certainly didn't in the past. And I, I wanted to ask you how you feel about it presently. But in the past, you'd say that the doctors wouldn't even give you an explanation. It's almost as if they didn't need to give you an explanation why your why your babies died do you think it still happens um in in our public hospitals today oh i do think and i'm sorry to say i think it is even worse now you, you know, do mm. in all honesty our hospitals were, were hospitals at that time they were so well kept you could smell like that all when you go walk into the hospital. Hmm. Right now, you don't know. It's the numbers. It's the great numbers of people that go to the hospital. Or what is it? As, as it is right now, I don't have a medical aid. Mm-hmm. So I still go to the public hospital. You can go there at 6 o'clock in the morning you are sure to find more than 500 people there. Sure. So the numbers, Mm. the numbers, and I think the numbers of doctors versus the patients, it just does not comply. Mm. So it's it's not any better. Yeah, it's an it's a it really is an ongoing problem. It's um, an ongoing mm, problem. Mm. Emma, we're going to we're going to take a break, and uh, after the break, um, I, I want to hear all about when you first started working um, as at Henochsburg uh, Clothing yes. Factory, um, and and how you then started working at the Garment Workers Union. Okay. One hundred five FM. Well, if you have just tuned in, you've tuned in at a very good time. I have Emma Mashinini um, on the line. And uh, Emma Mashinini is an extraordinary woman who has lived an extraordinary life. Um, Her activism began when she was elected as a a shop steward. Um, She she then um, was the first general secretary of the Commercial Catered and Allied Workers Union of South Africa. Um, She was arrested. She had been in solitary confinement. She has done incredible things in this country um, and she's written a book. In fact, she wrote this book many years ago in 1989 um, and it was, I'm sure, um, and Emma's listening to me, I'm sure it was a cathartic experience being able to write this book and get everything out on paper. And one would think that a book that was written in 1989 would not have relevance in 2012. But in fact, it is so relevant relevant and that the story of Emma Mashanini is an inspiration to many not just women but to men and not just South Africans but to all human beings um, and it's just the the human struggle um, and the fight um, to do what is right and to speak out against what is wrong and just this incredible human spirit to overcome so many difficulties so we have um, Emma Mashanini on the line and incidentally if you have any questions for Emma during this interview interview you can sms me on 34519 so emma welcome back 
sector. Now, Emma, you started working at Henosburg Clothing Factory. And in fact, before I even interviewed you, I read um, uh, the excerpt from your book when you describe just what it was like in your day, waking up so early, having to prepare for your children, being away the whole day, coming home, having to attend to your husband and cook. And it was just this ongoing, you know, stress and hard work. And, and that church for you was just a wonderful, wonderful time. Why did you start working at a clothing factory? Because you hadn't been working up until that point. 